existential risk. The whole idea here is we want to end up like neither of these folks, not like the dinosaurs that got extinguished 66 million years ago by an impactor, and not like uh, the folks who might perish in a global thermonuclear war. Mm -hmm. So the too long didn't read version of this talk is I think the most important challenge in the 21st century is, is really simple. It's simply to survive into the 22nd century. And we might not, right? It's basically the option between falling into a global disaster like nuclear winter or colonizing Mars and flourishing. And I think evolutionary psychology and all of what we do here might actually be able to help quite a bit uh, to understand some of the psychological barriers to succeeding at this pretty important challenge. Here, I'll be talking about not individual level existential crises, like you read Nietzsche, and you get a divorce, and you sit on a rock worrying about Brexit. Um, <laughs> but I'm talking about existential risks to the entire species, where all humans could go extinct, maybe even most vertebrates on the planet could go extinct because some Dr. Strange love and then some new weapon. I got into this by getting involved in the effective altruism movement, a new ethical and social movement that tries to maximize long-term global sentient well-being. Um, very humble people. Um, I, I've done about 15 or so publications on various aspects of, of the evolutionary psychology of moral virtues and altruism and research ethics, but it's really my um, fiance, Diana Fleischman, who is here there, um, who got me into effective altruism. Uh, especially 2016 sabbatical where I toured around and visited a lot of the people working on this stuff. And since then I've given about 10 talks on various EA topics around the world. Peter Todd and I published a paper in the journal Biological Theory specifically on uh, the evolutionary psychology of aliens and what to expect from them and why the, the, the most colossally idiotic idea in history has been to actively send messages to unknown aliens, <laughs> which people are doing, um, particularly in, in the Crimea from the Astoria radio telescope. I've also taught twice a psychology of effective al altruism class, and we focus on the whole range of EA issues, which includes um, global public health and poverty and moral psychology, utilitarianism, animal welfare, factory farming, all of that stuff. But it's really the existential risks that have caught my eye. Um, if you want to learn more about the class, the syllabus is up online on primalcolly.com. This is a great book by Will McCaskill, Doing Good Better, that gives an overview of EA issues. But he doesn't get much into X risk because it's, it's kind of a downer. <laughs> but the heart of EA, the, the intellectual and ethical heart of it now, has become minimizing X risk. The people who take this seriously think, Global poverty, animal welfare, that's great, but it's basically just rounding error compared to X risk. And for that reason, um, you know, big donors are starting to give a lot of money to found academic centers like Center for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge, Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, Future of Life Institute here in Boston, Machine Intelligence Research Institute in Berkeley that deals with AI safety, and Center for Effective Altruism, I guess mostly in London. So this is sort of the heart of EA, but they need help. They need guidance from people other than just AI researchers and moral philosophers. And that could be us. We could help. I think the major X risks, um, there's a lot of consensus about this, actually, what the major ones are. I think the big three, the likely ones and the ones that could actually wipe us all out, are nuclear war followed by nuclear winter, or super bombs, genetically engineered bioweapons, or super plagues, particularly worrying because it's a lot easier to engineer a super plague than to enrich uranium and build a, a nuke. And also artificial general intelligence, or super brains, like Ultron or Skynet, depending on what generation you are. <laughs> Less likely X risks that are genuine X risks that could exterminate all of us would be extraterrestrial contact with aliens and certain natural disasters super volcanoes, impactors, supernovas, gamma ray bursters. There is also a category of global catastrophic risks that could kill lots of people, like a billion or two billion people, but that almost certainly will not kill everybody. And those include runaway climate change, like Antarctic ice sheets melting, 
or an actual pandemic, some kind of super flu. This is the key slide that I, I want you to take home. Um, X risks are unimaginably bad, and I mean unimaginably literally that our Pleistocene brains are not capable of comprehending the scale. Uh, they could kill all the currently living humans, and there's a lot more of us, you know, 7.7 billion now compared to 1 billion in 1800, that's 10 to the 10th. They could also kill all 10 trillion or so wild vertebrates that could go on to become human level intelligences at some future point. Right, so it's set the evolutionary clocks at way back. Um, but depending on your estimates, and these are from Nick Bostrom, they could stop from coming into being all the potential future lives that could emerge from our lineage. And that could be up to the 10 to the 30th future humans, post-humans, AIs, other sentient beings, um, given the carrying capacity of the Laniakea supercluster, the 100,000 galaxies that include the Milky Way if we get ambitious. So the positive stakes are unimaginably high. That would be a really, really good thing to do if you believe most sentient beings on average are experiencing positive utility and they're fairly happy. If we experience some kind of great filter, like mm -hmm. the people who work on the Fermi paradox <laughs> think most other um, you know, extraterrestrial life probably experience, if we fail, those costs are relatively unimaginably high. But those are opportunity costs. Right, that aren't very salient to us. Zero future sentient beings. Right? That versus that is what we're talking about. Now, if those 10 to the 30th future sentient beings had votes, if they could participate in the democratic mm -hmm. process, they would probably want us to spend every waking moment minimizing X risk. They would probably be asking, why are you guys spending 10% of GDP minimizing X risk? Why are you doing all this, this bullshit stuff you're doing? But they don't have votes, and that's the problem. So I want to go through five, thanks. Now I, now I sound less like a street corner preacher. I have all EAs, if you get, get a couple drinks in them, and they're like, it's all about the X-Risk, man. Um, Okay, so there's five glitches in human psychology that make it hard to appreciate X risks. I'll go through these really quickly because time constraints. One is tribalism, anthropocentrism, short-sightedness. We're, we're social primates shaped by urgent survival issues and group competition and a little bit of moralistic signaling. We focus on tribal and partisan and national issues, not global risk management or global governance of AI safety. Uh, we focus on human rather than non-human or post-human issues. Right? And we focus on current news and whatever is up on, on Twitter rather than far future well-being. So we're poorly adapted to think about X risks. And here I borrow a lot from Eliezer Yudkowsky, um, Graham et al., and, and Nick Bostrom. So there's a mismatch. There's also the availability heuristic, right? When we're judging risks, we rely on concrete and familiar examples, particularly from media, like risks as portrayed in vivid dramas like science fiction movies. Those are more salient than actual gradual distributed systemic X risks. And there's really no commercial incentive for journalists or screenwriters or politicians to portray and address X risks effectively. When they do, even somewhat well, right? Like when War Games came out in 1983 and President Reagan saw it, Reagan took it seriously and thought, oh, global thermonuclear war, bad, and we actually changed nuclear policy. When a couple of movies about um, asteroid impacts came out in the late 90s, it actually changed policy and we got more global coordination about tracking potential impactors on asteroids. Um, it's just hard to do that well. Like in, event, in Age of uh, Ultron and the Avengers, the real battle happened in the first few minutes. It was Ultron in blue versus Jarvis in gold. And once the bad AI won, the rest of the movie was just kind of ridiculous, right? It's, it's robots fighting each other. Glitch three is empathy. Human empathy doesn't track global future utility. Why would it have evolutionarily? We evolved more to do virtue signaling and some reciprocity and a little group coordination than to do real effective altruism based on utilitarian concerns. And as Paul Bloom argued, we have empathy towards identified lives rather than rational compassion about statistical lives. But to utilitarians, 
a single death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a million tragedies. So a related glitch was scope neglect. Prehistoric selection didn't distinguish between tribal X risks, where your tribe gets wiped out, and global X risks affecting the whole planet. There's no selection pressure to make that distinction. So it's very hard to appreciate the cosmic stakes, the spatial scale of what we fail to colonize, the temporal scale of how long we fail to live, the computational scale of how awesome it would be to convert all the baryonic mass in the universe into sentient computronium, as a motto is argued for, etc. Um, some people get it. Elon Musk gets it. His whole career, ever since he was a teenager, has been devoted to establish a multi-planetary society to minimize X risk. And every year we delay colonizing Mars, we increase the chance of human extinction. Um, this is the most depressing estimate I've ever heard in my life. Every second we delay colonizing the supercluster, we lose 10 to the 29th potential future human level sentient beings. That's Boss from 2003, before he learned how to do some PR on this without making yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this, this is actually the last and maybe most, um, the deepest problem. We feel moral disgust at utilitarians. This is research by Molly Crockett and others. So we favor, uh, people favor absolute moral rules over people who estimate costs, benefits, and risk. We trust the ontologists who, who you know, advocate for absolute rules more than we trust utilitarians. Like Thanos was a misguided utilitarian. Every evil genius in every Hollywood movie is a misguided utilitarian. <laughs> All the heroes are deontologists. Um, and we treat utilitarian reasoning, like I've been doing in this talk, as acute psychopathy. So, what do we do about it? Last two slides. I think in terms of priorities, it's really important not to catastrophize about bad things that aren't actually X risks. Not to treat social inequality as an X risk. It isn't. Maybe it's a global catastrophic risk, maybe it isn't even that. Maybe nationalism could contribute to X risks indirectly, but it's not an X risk. Global warming is certainly not an X risk. It could become a global catastrophic risk, but it's small potatoes compared to AI or bioweapons. Education, we can cover this stuff better. I think we need more positive messaging about cosmic potential that will help people visualize future lives and awesome outcomes and future civilizations. A lot of science fiction does this. Jeff Bezos just purchased the rights to Ian Banks' novels, my favorite science fiction novels. Hopefully that'll be an awesome TV series that will make people go, oh yeah, we could do better. There's, final slide, a deep problem though. I think a lot of people in EA realize this is a problem. There might be a fundamental trade-off between democracy and freedom versus management of X risks effectively. X risks require global coordination to stop to shut down, by any means necessary, research and development on bioweapons and AI and to do very good nuclear risk management. Mm -hmm. But even small labs can create big X risks. Right? You can engineer bioweapons in, in one university or one terrorist group. So, do we need a total global surveillance state to manage global X risks? What are the trade-offs there? I'm a libertarian, but I would be willing to give up a lot of freedom to reduce X risks. I'd be willing to take out the uh, Pretoria radio telescope if they start broadcasting messages to ETIs. And if we don't stop X risks, X risks for example, in America, other countries that, are, that have more foresight, like China, might do that. I could easily imagine the People's Liberation Army sending special forces to attack the deep mine, uh, people who make you know, AlphaGo in London. So there's gonna be some geopolitical issues around how to manage this. I hope we as evolutionary psychologists can contribute to, to solving this. Uh, thank you. I think there's time for questions. Yeah, there's like three minutes. How does that happen? Okay. Yeah. Are um, lives that, have, that are sentient and autonomous more valuable than lives that are sentient but don't have autonomy? I don't know. I have intuitions, but I don't trust those intuitions. 
So I'm not saying I believe this argument, but I wanted to get your thoughts. I'm very naive when it comes to effective altruism, and I would have thought affected altruists would say the most effective thing to do is give cash and antibiotics to the poorest people in the world, and that'll save the most lives. It never occurred to me to think about existential risks, and so this is the most, I mean, I'm not saying I believe this, but this is the most cynical possible take on what is happening in the effective altruism movement. Giving cash and antibiotics is ultimately a very non-sexy thing to do. Thinking about global catastrophes, like an uh, 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 AI that wipes us all out, very sexy, funders, that's sexy to fund. Do you think, what, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think this is kind of a legitimate criticism, but I think this is one of those few cases where virtue signaling and intelligence signaling is actually pushing in the right direction. Like, I really do think extras should get more attention. Like, these centers are being funded, but they're being funded at less than 1% of the money we spend on cancer research. But I think it's, it's orders of magnitude more important. So even if this, this becomes like the cause du jour of a bunch of Bay Area Aspies, Right. That's fine. That, that's how most causes start, actually. Okay. Yeah. It's funny how domain specific that is, but I agree, you could learn some messages from Greenpeace, and I think their opposition to nuclear is so fundamentally irrational and misguided. But they have succeeded in getting people to at least pretend to think long term about that particular issue, and that could be leveraged to think about other issues that actually are X risks. Okay. Okay. I don't want to cut into, into time, so thank you.